So this is the theme verse in Hebrews chapter 12, 1. In your handouts or up here on the screen, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and again, that's referencing Hebrews chapter 11, where you have all these legends of faith listed there. He's saying, hey, since we have all these legends, and they're actually witnessing us, they're, they're watching us and encouraging us run our race, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles And let us run with, and here's a key statement, you guys, that we're going to even talk about today. Let us run with perseverance. That's necessary. Perseverance is necessary if you want to win the race marked out for us. So last week, the first guy we we kind of called out of heaven to join us on our lap was Jacob. Today, we're going to call out Elijah, and Elijah is going to come and teach us from his life. And today, what I kind of want to do is take you on this journey of Elijah's story um, that kind of, at the, uh, we're going to study his climax, where it was his highest high, and, and where he got to his, his lowest low. So if Elijah were to like come and talk to us in our journey of life, I think he'd say this. I think he'd say, um, you know, when it doesn't look right, um, because oftentimes it didn't. For Elijah, he would say, man, it did not look right. I was, I, I, sometimes I was on the mountain, but I also experienced the lowest lows. But when it doesn't look right, here, write this down in your notes. God is for us, and he is more than enough. Can I get an amen, church? Come on, you just got to know this. And Elijah will, will, I believe, say this with passion and experience, that when it doesn't look right, God is for you, and he is more than enough. So let me give you a little context to Elijah and his story and what was happening in his day. He was a prophet of Israel. In his day, there was, there was a lot of idol worship. They were worshiping false gods. The king at that time was King Ahab. And Ahab was an evil king. The Bible actually says he was, the, he was the most evil. He was the 19th consecutive bad king, but he was the worst of the worst kings. And he was married to the worst of the worst woman named Jezebel. And it was just this, this crazy duo of evil. And, and the, the, so God calls Elijah to confront um, King Ahab in the middle of this culture of vice false idol worship, and of all the worst things that he did, all like the bad things that that King Ahab did, the worst thing that he did was he continuously turned the hearts of the people away from the one true God to the false gods of Baal and Asherah. Now, the, the, the god Baal, the false god Baal, was the sun god or the fire god, and Asherah was kind of was Baal's wife, but he would, con- he would continuously move people to, uh, from worshiping God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to these false gods of Baal and Asherah. So let me draw a few. What I want to do today is, is draw a few principles from the height of, I- of Elijah's experience and his story and also his low. Um, so write down some notes to me today. Number one, here's the first principle from Elijah's story, and that is this, that false, go- false gods promise what only God provides. See, false gods will promise you things that only God can provide. It may look good. It may sound good. It may have the promise of feeling good. But listen, God is for you, and he is more than enough. Let me just say something that's so important to God. It's like it's the most important thing to God in your life is your worship. Is your heart. That's the most important thing to God is your worship, your attention, your affection, your heart, your focus. That's what God desires most in our life. In fact, it it was it was the first commandment, the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments that God gave Israel. The first one was worship the Lord your God only, only don't put no other gods before me. When Jesus was walking the earth in the New Testament, he was, he was asked by someone, hey, what's the most important commandment of God? And Jesus reiterated it. He said, the first and most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, above all, the most important thing to God is your worship, is, is your focus and your heart, which, which makes a lot of sense why Satan who's the arch enemy of God, if Satan wanted to hurt God, wouldn't he go after what's most important to him? So if what's most important to God is your heart and your worship, it makes sense now that why Satan throughout history has been trying to move the hearts of mankind off of the worship of the one true God to false idols that promise things what only God can deliver. 
This has been happening all throughout history. It's a sin of idolatry. For example, there is a false god of money. How many know money's a false god? How many would say that money is a false god today? If you agree, say yes. Yeah, there's a false god called money. What does money do? Money promises things that only God can give. Money promises to make you happy. Money promises to make you secure. But it, it, can, it cannot deliver on that because the, the day that you get that doctor's notice that you have cancer, there is no amount of money that can make you secure in that moment. It, it could not deliver on its promise. It can't. It's a false idol. It, it, what good is it if I have all this money, if one of my children, God forbid, get lost or, or go to be with the Lord early on? Not only, it would, nothing could, no amount of money could comfort you in that moment. It is a false idol that promises what only God can give. The false gods promise, if you worship me, I'll make your crops grow. <laughs> you know, if you worship me, I'll make your life better. They promise what only God can give. So God raises up an Elijah to confront this, this um, king, Ahab. And he basically says, because of your idolatry, God is going to withhold the rain from the land of Israel. And there's going to be a drought for three years because you've turned the hearts of the people towards false idols. And there's this drought, there's famine, there's a lot of death and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, famine in, in the land. People are dying and for three years there's a drought. And God, after three years, wants Elijah again to go confront King Ahab. And we pick up the story here in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. It says, when Ahab saw Elijah, now he hadn't seen him in a long time. He's actually been, you know, hunting him down for a while. He said to him, is that you? You troubler of Israel. Now, that word troubler in Hebrew, it, it can be also translated as snake or viper. So that, this, is, this is King Ahab going, is that you? You no good, low down snake of a dog. He's just, it's all your fault that there's this drought. There's, these people are dying. The drought is your fault that this is happening. And, I, and Elijah just kind of fires back and he says, you're not going to put this on me. I haven't made trouble for Israel. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. You, you put false gods ahead of the one true God. And, and, and now, granted, most people today, they're not worshiping the false god of Baal. No, no. The false gods today are still around. They're just more socially acceptable. They're, they're still here. Satan's scheme is still the same. It's just we, we don't call them false gods anymore. See, some of us worship, we do worship the false god of money. We, we worship the false god of material possessions, our house and our cars. We worship the false gods of our career and our hobbies and our favorite sports. And we worship all these false gods of our image and our looks. Anything that you put on the throne of your life that gets your attention, that gets your focus, that gets your worship and adoration above God is idolatry. It could be even good things that God intended to be good and enjoyable in your life can become an idol. It's why even your children can become idols in your life if you put them on the throne and above honoring God. It's just more socially acceptable to idolize your children and success and money and things. So Elijah, the, the prophet, steps into this polytheistic culture. They had, they had all these false idols for different things that they want in their life, which again, today there's so many different false idols. Different ones for the different things we want in our life. Wow, this, is, this is for security. This is for happiness. This is for pleasure. This is for this. And, this is, and we have all these things, these idols in our, in our lives. And I pray for revelation today that God will re reveal to you what has taken the place. He steps in with a prophetic and very strong statement. Watch this in verse 19. He says to King Ahab, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. We're going to have a showdown, man. This is what we're going to have. This is the famous showdown of Elijah and it says, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, time out right there. I just want to say, that's one big honking table right there. Come on now. And now you have 850 prophets at the table. Okay, verse 21. Here's what Elijah, he gets in their face here. Elijah went before the people and he asked this piercing question. He asked, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver? Then he says, if the Lord is God, what do you do? Say it out loud. If the Lord is God, 
but if Baal is God, what do you do? Follow him. But the people said nothing. He steps into this culture and he says, how long will you waver between these two things? If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, just, just go, just do it. Just follow him. And I guarantee you, if Elijah was here today, he would say to us, quit wavering. Quit acting like a Christian on Sunday and a heathen on Monday. Okay, somebody? Quit, quit, quit proclaiming Christ and living like you don't know him. Quit, quit wanting all the benefits, but none of the sacrifice. Just quit wavering between these two opinions. In other words, he says, if God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, he said, follow him if he's God. Okay, so in other words, if material possessions is your God, if that's the most important thing in your life, follow, follow go all in. Just don't, just don't try to accumulate stuff, some stuff. Accumulate it all. Go all in. Get into massive debt. You know what I mean? If that's the most important thing, then it's no, all limits are off. Steal if you got to steal. Because if the most important thing is accumulation and stuff, then, then and by the way, don't give anything. Don't ever be generous because it diminishes your God of accumulation and material things. Just go all in, he says. If that's your God, if that's what's most important, why stop? Just stop wavering and do it then. Go all in. Go all in. If your image is your, your God, then don't, don't just stop with just like kind of, you know, primping it up. Go all in. Three hours at the gym, right? Some of you are already there. You're like, I'm there, Pastor. I said, come on now. <laughs> come on. He says, no, no. Don't just, if that's, if that's what's most important to you, go serve it then. Go, go all in. Curl it. Tat it. You know, you know, po- you know make up it. Do whatever you want. Do, do everything you need to that thing. Put, dress it in whatever you want. Go into that and just... Just if that's your God, go for it. If your house is your God, don't do this. Whole, and the most important thing to you is that kind of image. Then don't, don't do this whole one room at a time thing. Do it all. Hire the best contractors, the best landscapers. Just do it all. But, he says, if Christ, the Son of God, is the one true God, then stop wavering and serve him only. Yeah. Worship the Lord your God. If he is the true God, then stop wavering and worship him. Serve him with your life. Quit wavering, he says. Don't just claim him and live like he doesn't exist, but serve him. And I just feel that the sense of the power of Elijah today just telling us, quit. Wa- how long will you waver between these two opinions? So what did he do? He has this showdown. I don't have, the, I don't have it in your notes. It was, it's, it's some, go, today, go read 1 Kings chapter 18. It's really cool. 1 Kings chapter 18, there's a showdown, 850 to 1. 850 false prophets to one prophet. Elijah says, come on, you call out. Cry out to your God. See if he'll come. Go ahead, cry, shout louder. They shout, they cut themselves. If you want the crazy things, their God doesn't show up. Elijah steps in, says a prayer, and fire consumes the entire place and kills every one of those false prophets. Hey, listen, go, go ahead. If that's... If, if, if that's your, your God, if you have, I'm telling you, you, if you serve false gods, they won't show up when you need them. They can't, they can't provide. They can't, they can't, they make the false promise, but they can't, they can't do it. Only God can provide what those false gods are promising. God is for you, and he's more than enough. Amen. You can clap. You can clap. Do it. Amen. Praise him. Here's a second principle we want to see at this, at this part of Elijah's experience, at the height of his experience. Here it is, number two, write this down. Faith is seeing life from God's perspective. Man, faith is seeing life because sometimes, hey, sometimes it's not going to look right. <laughs> but in that, in that time, you need to know God is for you and he is more than enough. But there is a difference, church, between believing and knowing. There's a difference. Jesus said, even, even the devils believe and they tremble. So there's a difference between believing and knowing. And I kind of feel like sometimes the church has rested, or at least maybe we have rested in this, in this even like a statement. Some of you have even said this statement. And it's a statement found in the New Testament. One guy says it to, to Jesus. And it was an honest statement of where he was in that moment. He said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And, and if that's where you're at, honesty is, is, is where you need to start first. But don't, but don't elevate unbelief to a place that God doesn't want it operating in your life. James says it this way. 
Okay, it's not wrong to have unbelief. Verbalize that thing. But God wants, God wants to move you from unbelief to believe. James chapter 1 says that those who are asking of God and who are, who are, who are need help and need from God, he said they, they, they need to believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. He goes on in James chapter 1. And I got to read James chapter 1, Pastor Mario, like every month. Because he jacks me up. He puts me on the straight and narrow. He says anyone who's like that, who doubts like that, shouldn't think he would receive anything from God. And he goes on to say, Be, why? Because he is unstable in everything he does. See, faith is, faith is knowing. It is, it is knowing that all things work together for the good of those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. The Bible says that faith is a way of seeing. It's a perspective of things. And it's not your perspective. It's not even my perspective. It's God's perspective. Faith is seeing life from God's vantage point, from the vision and perspective of God. So right after the showdown, God decides to have mercy and, and, and bring rain again on the land. And he tells Elijah this, and in, in verse 41, we pick it up. Elijah tells King Ahab, hey, go eat and drink something. I hear a sound, he says. There is a sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. This is like a posture of like, like he's praying. He's like passionately like interceding. You can just get the picture of him, face in between his knees, just crying out to God. And he tells his servant, go look to the sea. And he went and looked, and he says, there is nothing there. How many people would have stopped right there? Would have stopped, it, you know, would have begun to doubt, would have begun to just change their perspective, would, would give up in that, in that moment of, of not seeing nothing, not being able to. And, and faith sometimes feels that way. Faith sometimes starts as, as, as a nothing. Where, where, and just because you can't see anything does not mean God is not working. Very often, for very long periods of time, God is working behind the scenes in a spirit realm that does not manifest itself in the physical that your eyes can see until much later. That's why if you're walking by faith, listen, you can't go off of what you see. You need to go off of what you've heard. Oh, come on, church, I'm preaching so much better than you responded. You can't go off of what you've seen. You need to go off of what you heard God say. You know his word. You know what he said. So Elijah said, I hear a sound of a heavy rain. God told me that until that I would pray I, I, that there, no rain would come, but I hear it now. I hear the word of God. I hear the rain, and it's coming. And if I, if I get caught up in my sight, I'll begin to doubt and be discouraged. But faith is seeing the impossible. Isn't that Hebrews chapter 11? What is faith? It's the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen in certain of the things we do not see. Let me say it this way. Accomplishing the impossible starts with perceiving the invisible. Accomplishing the impossible starts with perceiving the invisible. Here in verse 44, seven times it says, Elijah said, go back, go back, go back, go back. Then it came to pass the seventh time that his servant said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. Now, great faith, listen, great faith seems insignificant at first. It seems like something small at first. That's why our theme verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, he says, that, that to, to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. You got to keep pressing and moving and persevering because great faith seems like nothing at first. It seems small. It seems insignificant. And seven times he had to go back. Seven times he had to intercede. Seven times. Oh, but it's as small as a hand. You know what? Great faith doesn't feel like nothing at first. I remember when I first started serving God in ministry, and I, I did my first Bible study, my first small group, and it was two guys that showed up. I, I could have got discouraged in that moment, but I was fired up to take those two guys on a journey. When I first, when I started doing evangelism and, and, and outreach ministry and street teams, and I remember it was me and one other pastor that would show up and nobody else. And in that moment, I could have been discouraged. I, but I, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 says, Do not despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord loves to see the work begin. 
Man, if I would allow myself to get discouraged when the first gathering of Discovery Church was three families in a living room just, just uh, less than five years ago, we would not be where we are here today because accomplishing the impossible starts with perceiving the invisible. Faith is seen from God's perspective. Faith, false God's promise, what only the one true God provides. Here's the third thing I think Elijah would we can learn from his experience, and that's this, that your faith, yes, they can move mountains, but your doubt can also create them. I think, uh, I, I really do, I think Elijah would get real. I think Elijah wouldn't just put on with us and be like, and just share all the good stuff and share like, this is what I did, man, and I was the man at fire and rain, and man, yeah, I, I, you know, the widow at Zarephath, and I, were, I saw the dead rise to life, that dead child came to life at my word as I prayed, and I, I think he would... I think, honestly, if you had a moment with us, he'd not only tell us about the faith and, and, and how to believe God and how to see correctly the things of God, but I think he'd get real with us for a moment and said, you know what, I did see mountaintop experiences by faith, but I also saw, saw some, some valleys by my doubt. Here's what it says. It picks up now. Right after that story, the rain, the prophets just consumed by fire, the false prophets, the rain comes right after that, verse 19, chapter 19, verse 2. It says, so Jezebel, the queen of Ahab, sent the message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed my, my prophets, just as you killed all my buddies. Elijah, look at this, was afraid. And as I, when I read that, I just, I honestly get a little shocked. Don't you get a little shocked at this man of God, this prophet who is seen? God do the miraculous, the dead raised to life, okay? The fire from heaven, 850 to 1, succeeded and victorious by the hand of God. But here now, after all of that, actually the Bible says that, that once he prayed for rain, he was tearing and tearing seven times, man. And you don't know, we don't know how far like the, the, the servant had to go to come back, but seven, he was praying and you're seeing the Bible says that when he said, hey, small hand, the Bible says he lifted up his little skirt thing and he ran so fast, he was filled with the power of God and he outran King Ahab's chariot that left earlier than him and he got to the capital before him. So this is, Elijah was just like, man, on cloud nine almost. He had just been used so mightily by God, and here he is, filled with fear. And he fled. He ran from his life at the threat of this queen. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. And I really think that Elijah would get real with us for a moment. And, he'd say, and he would say, he'd say, hey, man, I was... Man, I saw the fire of God. It was so cool, 850 to 1, and God showed up. Uh, you got to read that story, too. That was so cool. He told those false prophets. He said, Cry, yell out louder. Maybe he, maybe he can't hear you. He even said, he was like, maybe he's in the restroom. Won't you, maybe, maybe you just wait a little bit. Maybe your God's in the restroom. Maybe he's busy, you know. And, and he just was playing on him, man. And, and then, he's, then the rain comes, and he sprints off. Man, I think, I think Elijah will get real with us, and this is what he would want to tell us. Write this down that your faith will dry up when you run on emotion instead of devotion. Your faith will dry up when you go from Sunday to Sunday seeking an emotional high instead of devotional life. Because Elijah, he was, he, I'm telling you, he did, it, it, was, it was fire, it was rain, it was running, it was the power of God. And, and quite honestly, he allowed, him, he allowed, I believe he allowed himself to get to a place where he was emotionally stirred, but not devotionally steady. Come on, somebody. Many of you are here today because you need this word. You need to hear this word from God. Many of you, some of you are here today and you're, you're blue, you're down. Some of you are here today and you're in a full-blown depression. Some of you are in a, a, a full-blown burnout because of the running on your own energy and your own emotion here. If that's where you're at today, there's good news. The good news is God wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to you. And, if, and Elijah now kind of closing up his time with us would want, us would want to get real with us and tell us this. And I believe he'd say, hey, man, I was in that place of depression, of isolation, of burnout, and in, right there, in the middle of that place, God spoke to me. And he didn't, when he spoke to me, check it out, he didn't, he didn't condemn me. 
He didn't tell me what's the matter with you. Why didn't you have faith? Why didn't you believe me more? He didn't say, Elijah, why didn't you read some more Bible verses and memorize some more verses? He, he didn't say that. This is what God said. This is number one. God, God would say, eat and rest. Come on. Someone who loves eating as much as me, say amen. amen. Don't you just, come on, man. I love this about God. Man, he always shows up on the scene and feeding people. That's so awesome. God's, I just love it. And this is, this is what he does. The first prescription here for your depression, for your burnout, whatever cave you find yourself isolated into, whatever, whatever cave you are hiding into, for whatever reason you're hiding into, the first prescription for your cave experience, God says, eat and rest. Look at chapter 19, verse 5. It says, all at once the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. I think that's just so awesome about God. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat again, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. You see, sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is rest. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is rest. I think, I think this, is, this is probably one of the most disobeyed commands of God in the entire Bible. God says, honor me with a day of rest. Honor me with a Sabbath. And we hear that, we read that, we listen to that, and we go, ah, we just scoff it off in our culture today in the fast pace. Because I'm, I'm honestly feeling the same thing you're feeling at this point. I'm like, well, I'm kicking back a little, like, but I got to do this, and I got to do that. And there's, there's so much that, that we have, you know, going on in our minds. And, and I, I just, Elijah, I believe, would say, what good is it? What good is it if you accomplish that stuff, but burn out and fade away? What good is it if you get all the laundry done, but kill your husband? What good is it? Okay. <laughs> What good is it? If you, I mean, seriously, what good is it if you get the tasks done that are on your list and keep going, 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 and you dry up spiritually and emotionally? The angel of the Lord provides food and rest and then lets him go take a nap, and it says, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days, 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, this is the same mountain a lot of theologians believe is the mountain that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. So this is really cool. God's prescription for your cave that you're in, maybe even today, whether it's burnout or depression or isolation or loneliness, whatever that cave experience is for you, God's prescription is first, rest, eat and rest. And then secondly, I need you to, I need you to get somewhere where the presence of God can reach you. Someone say, go to church. Come on, somebody, go to church. You're in a cave? Get out that cave, eat, rest, and go to church, Okay. Okay, here it is. Here's the second thing Elijah would say. Go. God would say, eat and rest. And secondly, God replaces our lies with his truth. See, because in this, it's in this place of dryness that, that we're most susceptible to the lies of the enemy, to the attacks of the enemy. We, when we don't have the, the fortitude, the faith, the armor of God to, to, to quench the fiery darts, it's in this this place of dryness and personal drought in this low that we're so susceptible to start believing the lies of the enemy. And they're often lies about ourselves, about who we are and how God sees us. It sometimes is even lies about others and your, could even be lies about your, your church and leaders. And some of you have isolated yourself because, because of the same experience here like Elijah, that it happens to the best of us. I want you to know that. It happens to the prophets. It happens to the best of leaders. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, again, God knows what he's doing. God knows this. He, he's not asking the question to probe and figure it out. He's asking this question because he wants Elijah to verbalize it. He wants uh, Elijah to verbalize whatever lies that he is believing so that God can replace them with his truth. You know why? Because if you can't name it, you can't tame it. If you don't know, if you don't understand, if there's not clarity of the lie, then truth can't shine its light on it. So God will often have you face that thing. He knows it already. He knows your struggle. He knows what you're dealing with. But he wants you to face that thing and call it out. Check it out. It says he replied some of the lies that he's believed. Look at this. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. True. That's true. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. That was true too. Broken down your altars, true. 
and, and put your prophets to death by the sword. That was happening. True. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. False. False. That's a lie. I'm the only one left. False. I'm the only one who cares. False. I'm the only one that can do anything. False. I'm the only one that's going to get it done right. False. See, Elijah was assuming more responsibility than was actually his. And some of you have done that. Some of you have, you, you're, you love God, but you've isolated yourself because, because oh, oh, they don't do it right, and, and that person's not doing it right. And some people leave the church altogether because, oh, it's all wrong, and they're not doing it right, and, and find themselves in a cave of isolation in a dark place. And if you read on, God tells Elijah, he, he, actually, he tells him, no, really, Elijah, what's, I actually have seven, that's wrong, that's false, I have 7,000 people that I have reserved and preserved that have not bowed down to the false god of of Baal and Asherah. I have 7,000 who who are still seeking my face and praying, don't believe the lies. You're not the only one. And man, I can only imagine what God would say to some of us if we were to verbalize some of those lies, if we were to identify and and, and name it, if what he would say to us, where, where some of us would probably name we, we would probably say, my marriage is never going to be whole. Why? Why? Do we not serve the God of the impossible? Replace that lie with the truth. Some of you, you would say, my, children is, my child's never going to come to Christ. Why? Isn't it just with a little mustard seed? Cannot God move a mountain? Some of you say, well, I, I got a doctor's report and it's bad. I don't even have long enough to live. I, I, oh, is that the cap of God? Is that the cap of God's power? Many of us have bought into various lies. We believe the lies of the enemy. My life's never going to be better. I'm going to be all alone the rest of my life. I'm going to be in this dead-end job for the rest of my life. I'm never going to make a difference. I'm going to be alone. I'm never having a real relationship. And we buy into these lies, and God wants to take those lies and replace them with his truth. The Bible says, take every thought captive and bring it into the obedience of Christ. So God says, eat and rest, and then confront the lies. Confront them and, and, and replace those lies with his truth. Here's the third thing Elijah would say, that if you ever get in that place of drought, of difficulty, of loneliness, of isolation, whatever, if you ever get into a place where you find yourself in a cave, listen, God speaks in a still, small voice. God speaks in a still voice. Small voice. Now remember, this is Elijah. Elijah is used to God manifesting himself in power. And he's used to the fire, the wind and breath of God, the earthquake. He's used to, the, to, to just to see the, the, God, the power of God. And God says, no, that's actually not what you need in this season. That's not how I operate in this season. Look what he does in, in verse 11. The Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And and, and after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a what? Say it out loud. Came a, a gentle whisper. You see, sometimes when we're at our lowest, God speaks the softest. Have you ever noticed that? When we're at our lowest place, God will whisper and speak the softest. That's so important for for you to know. Because some of you are in a cave and you're afraid of the voice of God. You're afraid of what God has to say to you in your isolation. Because there's a part of us, all of us, that know when we get to that place, we know what God has called us to do and it's not the cave. We know how God has called us to walk and it's not the cave. And so some of us fear the voice of God in the cave. But can I tell you, you don't have anything to be afraid of. God's not mad at you. He's not going to yell at you or spank you or discipline you. That's not going to happen at all. All what God wants to do is whisper into your spirit life to love you, to care for you, to nourish you and support you. That's what God wants to give you is a gentle whisper. When we're at our lowest, God will speak the softest. And, and, and sometimes it's just a word, just one word. It's not a lot. It's not loud, but it's always just enough. Because God is for you, and he is more than enough. Amen, church? Amen. We're doing a series in August. I just want to kind of clue you into the series. And in August, we're doing a series called How to Hear the Voice of God. 
and I'm really excited. I've been studying this for a while. I just wanted to kind of put it on your radar already. We're going to get, I'm, I'm really stoked about this, and I even wanted to say, like, it's really easy to, to get into the Sunday, Sunday routine and not see the journey, the, the macro, the big picture. And I, I really love this. It's such a pri- privilege to go on this journey with you. And I want you to see this. Church, we're on a journey that every, every message and every series are so intentionally designed with the Holy Spirit to take us to deeper levels of intimacy, grace, and revelation. And I just, it, I'm telling you, it is one of the greatest privileges of my life to take you on this journey and to go on this journey together. So here's what Elijah would say. He'd say these three things, go eat and rest. He'd say, do that. And then God wants it because you're in that place. God will replace the lies with his truth. Then he wants to speak to you in that still small voice to breathe life back into you. And then number four, Elijah would say, hey, don't you stay there though, because God wants to give you something to do. God wants to give you something to do. God gives us a divine assignment. Look as it continues in verse 15. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. In other words, he says, go back to doing what prophets do. I love that. Go back to doing what prophets do. And I believe if the, the Spirit of the Lord wants, wants to speak to you today, and if you would hear him today, he, he would tell you, there's still something yet for you to do, man of God. There is still something yet for you to do, woman of God. Go back. Hey, I know you've been isolated. I know you've been in a cave for a season. Go back now and start doing what prophets do. And so you say, well, I'm not a prophet. Well, well, what are you? Are you a mom? Well, go back and do what moms do. Are you a husband? Go back and start doing what a husband should do. Are you a person of prayer? Go back and pray like, a, like the church of God should pray. Are you, are you a business person? Go back and do what business people are supposed to do. Whatever it is, I, I know, I know, I know that you're in a place where maybe you're, you're unsure or you're, you feel hopeless or you feel afraid, you've lost your confidence, you don't see it. But God, today, if you would hear me say, go back, oh man of God. Go back, oh woman of God, and do what God has called you to do. Go back and do what prophets do. And I take so much comfort Encourage in Elijah's story, because it's our story, you guys, it really is. We can be on our highest highs. We can be used by God and see God and see the favor of God. But also, we can get to a place where we're just low and drought and off. And that's honestly, that's why I take Mondays off as a pastor. I take Mondays as my day of rest, you guys, because Sunday for me, I'm pouring out so much energy and my, my spirit. I'm just giving and pouring. It's a full day for me. And if I don't, there were times when early in ministry, I didn't take the Sunday rest. And I got to this place of drought and dryness because I never paused. I, would, I was running on anytime I feel that, that, anytime I come off of a high and I feel like, oh my gosh, oh, I know that's a check in my spirit. Jason? You're running on emotion instead of devotion. You better pause. And some of you here today, and this is a timely word for you, that that maybe you came in today heavy and burdened in some form of a cave. And God doesn't want you to stay there. He's just going to whisper to you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to nourish you. He's going to breathe life back into you and give an assignment back to you. Come on, let's bow our heads right there all across this worship center.